Well, good morning. I'd like to welcome every one of you here this morning. If you're visiting with us, we extend a very special welcome to you. Thank you for stopping to, to worship with us this morning. We'd ask that you'd hang around for a few moments today to give us a chance to get to meet you. I wanted to let you know that Mark is not doing well today. He's uh, got some kind of a little bug there, and Robbie will be stepping in and filling the pulpit. We're very thankful and appreciative to Robbie. He found out last night that he was going to have to do this, so he's had a short night as far as sleep was concerned. And a special thanks to Dexter for stepping in to lead our singing this morning. Let's all pray. Holy Father, Almighty God, our King and our Creator, it's with humble hearts that we bow before you, thanking you for all that you do for us, thanking you for this opportunity that we have to be together as family to worship you. Help us to make today all about you, Father. Help our minds and our hearts to be open to your word. We pray for Robbie as he brings us the message that you'd bless him and his efforts there. We just thank you that we have the hope of eternal life all because of what your son has done for us. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Let's pray together. Holy God, our Father in heaven, uh, we come before you together, thanking you for the blessings of this day and for all the good things that we share in common through Jesus. We thank you, Father, uh, that we're under your protection and your care. And we're thankful to be covered uh, by the blood of, of Jesus, your son. We're all so thankful for this special time in our church as we share in the excitement of renewed fellowship and, and the anticipation of the good things to come. We thank you for the men here that serve as our shepherds, for James, Robbie, and Steve, for their strength, and for their leadership um, as they lead us into new and better things for the future. We thank you for the men here that can step in and, and fill, up, fill voids um, as Robbie is today for, for Mark. We thank you for Mark and uh, for the work he does here with us, um, for um, his teaching, and his encouragement that he provides from the pulpit. And um, we pray that um, this illness that, he's, that he has right now will be a minor thing and will be brief and he'll be back with us very soon. Father, there's, there's an air of excitement uh, among us as um, new plans and new things have been presented to us. We pray that uh, in this time of renewal that each one of us on a personal level will renew our commitment to you and our commitment to uh, the work that's before us here and also our commitment to each other. Father, there are many among us uh, that are suffering from various illnesses uh, right now. Um, Jimmy Webb. Eloise, Pat and Brenda, uh, Violet, just to name a few. There are many others uh, here uh, that have friends and family members that are also struggling with various health issues. Uh, some here are struggling with the virus right now. We also are thinking of um, Travis and Debbie as their struggles continue, and uh, we pray specifically uh, that in the upcoming scan that Travis would have, that there would be a marked improvement in his condition. Father, for all these we pray um, for your intervention, for your healing, uh, for your comfort, for your uplifting and encouragement, uh, and that you would see to their needs um, as they continue with their health struggles. Father, as we, we continue our worship uh, together, As we're in a time of renewal, uh, we pray that you would also revive our spirits here this morning as we worship you together, knowing that uh, Jesus went to the cross so that we could be brought back together with you and with himself and with each other. So it's in his name that we offer this prayer. Amen.
I had a request, so we're going to add that song on right now. And uh, I think she's going to help us. Okay. <laughs> Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Okay, go see. <clears throat> I'll put these on, Ben, as I can't see that back screen. <clears throat> Blessed assurance. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchased of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending bring from above echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day Perfect submission, all is at rest. I in my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above, filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Let's all stand for this song. This will be the song for the lesson. <clears throat> Time is filled with swift transition. Not an earth unmoved can stand. Build your hopes on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Hold to it to God's unchanging hand. Build your hopes on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Trust in him who will not leave you. Whatsoever years may bring. 
earthly friends forsake us, still more closely to him cling. Hold to God's unchanging hand, you've got to hold to his hand, to God's unchanging hand. Build your hopes on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hand. When your journey is completed, if to God you have been true, fair and right your home in glory, your enraptured soul will view. God's unchanging hand, you've got to hold to his hand, to God's unchanging hand. Build your hopes on things eternal, hold to God's unchanging hand. Please be seated. Our scripture reading this morning is taken from Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 28. And behold, a lawyer stood up and put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? How does it read to you? And he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Amen. Thank you, Dexter, for leading the song. I got goosebumps on that last one, Hold to God's Unchanging Hand. Uh, we're going old school today without the screen up here. Um, I got the, the message yesterday to uh, Mark was going to be sick and I just didn't have time. I have to tell a story on Travis though. It was January one year and Travis says, are you going to teach in Bible school, vacation Bible school this year? And I said, yes, I'd be happy to. And the next Sunday he brought in the lesson for, for June. He said, here's your lesson plan for next June. I said, Travis, you're wasting your time. I said, I, there's no way that I'm going to be able to keep this thing until next June. And I didn't. I lost it, and he had to give it to me again. I feel more comfortable being called at the last minute than I do six months ahead of time. I'm one of those fly by the seat of my britches kind of guys, and Robin can attest to that. Drives her batty sometimes. So anyway, I want to open with a, with a prayer for Mark. Father... We come to you again, and specifically in a prayer for Mark. I pray whatever this is that's going on with him will be settled quickly. I pray for his healing. I pray that he'll be back on his feet sooner than later. I pray that you'll take care of the situation. Be with him and Amy and Faith as they uh, have to navigate this, whatever it is. I just pray for a swift resolution and a quick return. It's through the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Roger alluded to it in his prayer. Uh, this is an exciting time uh, in the life of our congregation, and uh, I'm excited as well. Uh, our rooted groups, you know, th those are a good thing. They, they are a great thing. Uh, when we uh, first signed up for those, we had 120 people sign up to, to join the rooted groups, and out of a congregation, there's not a... Uh, a whole lot that didn't sign up. And I look at the relationships, not only in my rooted group, but I see relationships becoming developed and more developed in other rooted groups. I see people talking to each other that maybe didn't talk to each other before. I see people sitting together at, for instance, our, our last Wednesday night dinner that maybe wouldn't sit together before. These rooted groups are, are a great thing. They're developing relationships. Keith read the, the scripture reading there. I'm going to paraphrase it in Southern English. What must I do to go to heaven? 
You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says, that's it. You got it. Loving God with everything you got and loving your neighbor with everything you've got. If you do these two things, guess what? That's the ticket to heaven. Well, what about this long list of rules over here? What about this long list of rules over there? That, that wasn't in the equation. The answer is love God with all your heart, your soul, your strength, your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. If you're loving God with all your heart, your soul, your strength, and mind, those rules are just going to kind of kind of follow in there with ease. If you love your neighbor just like you love yourself, those rules are going to kind of fall in there. I seen a thing uh, a couple of months ago, and it said, I wish, let me, let me think about this, I wish your sins would bother you as much as my sins bother you. I wish your own sins would bother you as much as my sins bother you. And I have thought about that every day since that, and that's just one of those things that, that rattle around uh, up here. And we're gonna talk about these things in, in the lesson this morning. We've got a lot of exciting plans for the future. We've got a group of deacons that, that are unified that, that, that came up with the majority of this plan, and they're committed to doing a lot of hard work to make these plans happen. But these deacons and us elders, we can't pull all this off without the congregation. You know, it's going to take every one of us pulling together in a unified effort to achieve these goals and to achieve these plans. And I believe that we can do these things. I believe it's very possible. I believe if God gives his stamp a blessing on our plans, that, that, that they can't be stopped. I believe that with all my heart. This is an exciting time that we're facing here in our church. Mark mentioned last week in his lesson, we're going to hit a few road bumps, that there's going to be a few problems, there's going to be a few issues that we have to work out. And the Bible gives us clear definition of issues, of how to work out some issues. We must work out these issues and our problems with wisdom. We must work them out biblically. We must work them out according to to scripture. Working out our differences is aimed at something more significant than us getting our own way. Working out our differences to the next several years has eternal lasting effects upon it. Working out our differences is of eternal value. Our sin that we have, it breaks our fellowship with God when we're not loving God with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind. And our sin breaks our fellowship with each other when we're not loving our neighbor as ourselves. We've got to do both of these things. We must have the proper fellowship with God. We must have the proper fellowship with each other. In John chapter 13, he said, here's a new commandment. This is Jesus speaking. I give to you that you love one another, that you love one another just like I love you, and that you also love one another. He said that three times. Did you catch that? Love one another, love one another, love one another. By this, all men shall know that you're my disciples, if what? If you love one another. He didn't say you'll... They will know that you are my disciples if you keep the Ten Commandments. didn't say that. If you keep all the rules, if you do this, if you do that, he says they'll know that you're my disciples if you love one another by your love. We all have sins. We all have faults. We all get up on the wrong side of the bed. We all have issues that we struggle with because of things in our past, because of things perhaps, that we're dealing with. But the fact is that God demonstrated his love for all of us while we were still sinners 
he gave his son to die for us. He knew Robbie was going to sin. He sent Jesus anyway. He knew Robbie was going to struggle. He sent Jesus anyway. He knew Robbie wasn't going to be perfect. He sent Jesus anyway. While we were still sinners, while we were still struggling, while we were still imperfect, I'm going to send him anyway. That's how much he wants me back in his fold. That's how much he wants you back in his fold. While he knew we were imperfect, he sent his son to die for us anyway. Thankfully, God knows our weaknesses, and he tells us how to handle conflict due to sin. And the first step in managing conflicts is to ask yourself, is it me? Could it be me? Could I be the one in the wrong? Could I be the one that made the mistake? Could I be the one trying to impose my will over something else? That's, that's the very first thing. That, that will solve a lot of problems right there. Matthew chapter 7, he says, How can you say to your brother, Let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? It's hard to see to get that little speck out of somebody else's eye when I've got a, a big two-by-four sticking out of mine. It's, it's virtually impossible. What's going on in, behind your own eyes? Anyone that claims to be in the light but hates his brother is still in the darkness, 1 John tells us. Anyone who loves their brother and sister in the light, and there is nothing to do to make them stumble. But anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. They do not know where they are going because the darkness has blinded them. God is light. In him is no darkness at all. God is love. He commanded us to love him. He commanded us to love our brother. Not stumble around in the darkness. James 5, 16, that's one of my favorite verses. It's one of my mantras, I guess you would say. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other that you may be healed. How many of you have, have seen a brother or sister caught up in something and your first, your first response was, I need to go pray with that brother. I need to go pray about this. I need to go confess with him. I need to go listen to him. I need to develop this relationship with him. Confess your sins to each other. Pray for each other that you may be healed. If something is broken, if something is sick, if something is out of order, if something is not right, and you need healing, and you need salvation and resurrection, go pray with your brother that you may be healed. It'll put it back together. Thus saith the Lord. After that, after we discover, well, maybe it's me, maybe I just need to... To, to handle it, maybe I need to confess, maybe I need to pray, maybe I need to work things out within my own heart. He gives us two other ways that, that we can to help our brother. He gives us two other ways that we can love our brother. First Peter 4 and verse 8, it says, Above all, love each other. And then it adds the adjective deeply. Love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. Love covers a multitude of sins. It didn't say cover up. It didn't say cover the sin up. You remember in the Old Testament, Achan got the robes and the gold and he went in and put it in his tent and he covered it up. Well, that didn't work out well if you read the rest of that story. He didn't say cover it up. So what does it mean to cover sins? Love covers a multitude of sins. Proverb puts it this way. The mouth of righteousness is a fountain of life, but the mouth of the wicked conceals violence. Hatred stirs up conflict, but love covers all wrongs. Love covers all wrongs. 
One way to cover sin is just the infraction happens, whatever it is, and just say, I'm not letting this get to me. It's not worth it. I'm going to cover it. It's good. I'm going to forgive the infraction. I'm just going to move on. But there are some people who are not happy unless they are not happy. You hear what I said there? There are some people who are not happy unless they are not happy. Houston, we have a problem. It's easy to cover sin when it happens that day. Cover the sin. The best example of love that covers the sin is Jesus, sacrificed on the cross. His sacrificial death on our behalf. You remember the verse we read a while ago, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's how he covered our sins. He said, Father, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. Jesus covered our sins with his blood. And somewhere I read where it says, and he remembers them no more. Whatever that sin is, whatever that sin was, he covered it with his blood, he put it on the shelf, and he forgot about it. If we think we've covered the sin, but we go home and it gnaws at us and it chews at us and it works us, works us over still, we probably haven't covered it. But there's probably still something that needs to be worked out some way, somehow. But the easiest way to deal with the problem, if it's possible, is to cover that sin with love and forgiveness, just like Christ. Proverbs 19 11 says, A person's wisdom yields patience, but it is to one's glory to overlook an offense. It's possible to overlook offense. Love covers a multitude of sins because it embraces the other person. When you're looking after the other person, when you're loving your neighbor as yourself, when you're thinking about other people more than yourself, covering those sins become easier to accomplish. When we cover a sin, we're able to receive the other person, we're able to serve the other person, we're able to love the other person. Try to cover these offenses with love and forgiveness. If we're patient, and not envious or self-seeking, we are much likely to take offense at some things that really don't need to be have offense taken if we're patient and not envious. Then there are some offenses that that gnaw at us, that 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 eat us, that chew on us, that go a little deeper. Man, Robbie, I heard you. I'm supposed to cover this thing, but this thing just really bothers me. This thing just really under my skin. This thing just really, really got my goat. When you kicked my dog last week, that really made me mad. I'm not going to forgive you, or whatever that might be. The Bible's very clear on how to handle this. I'm going to go back to the first verse. What must I do to be saved? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, show your strength your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Matthew 5 puts it this way. Matthew 5, 23 and 24. If you are offering your gift at the altar, and you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift at the altar and go work things out with your brother. Now that, that's pretty heavy duty. If you're at a place of worship, you're bringing your gift to the altar. You're ready to place your gift at, at the altar. But you remember, you're still struggling with your brother. The Bible tells us, stop worshiping. Leave your gift. Go make things right with your brother. And this instant, in this verse, it's more important to make things right with your brother than it is to offer your gift. What must I do to go to heaven? Love the Lord my God with all my heart, my soul, my strength, my mind, and my neighbor as myself. If you don't love your brother whom you have seen, 
How can you love God whom you've not seen? This theme is just woven in the Bible from beginning to end. Loving one another. Love one another. Be reconciled to your brother. Then come offer your gift. Matthew 18 puts it this way. If your brother sins against you, go and talk to them. Just the two of you. Just you and him. One on one. Work it out. If he will not hear you, then take two or more with you that witnesses may be established. Go try to work it out. Go try to work it out. If he will not hear the two of you, then take it before the church. Truly I tell you, what you will bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And again, I tell you, if you agree on anything that they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For wherever two or three are gathered together in my name, that's where I am. And in the context of where this verse is written that we use all the time, wherever two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am. In the context of which that verse was written is in the context of working things out with your brother. We use that a lot in worship, and it's true, where two or three are gathered in his name, he is here. But it is also true when you're trying to work things out with your brother and two or three are gathered together in his name, he's there. And that's a great thing to know. Ephesians 4, 15 says, Speak the truth in love. We will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. Galatians 6, 1, brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. James 5, 19, brothers and sisters, if one of you wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Sometimes it takes action on our part to try to put the pieces back together, to try to talk to our brother, to try to work these things out, to ask God to be with us in the middle of these things. We can ask, is it our fault? Maybe it is, and let it slide. We can try to cover sin with love and forgiveness, just like Christ covered our sins. But sometimes we have to deal with it directly. Neither choice is easy. When we cover someone's sins, we intentionally set aside our personal feelings and our pride. But when we try to go directly to try to work out the problem, that can be more difficult because we don't know how we will be received. But still, we must go speaking in truth, speaking gently, speaking with love, hoping God will work these things out. The scripture is clear on how to work these things out. God does not permit us to stew on things for one year, two years, three years, four years. That's, that's, that's a problem. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It's not proud. It doesn't dishonor others. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. And here's the point that I wanted to make. It keeps no records of wrong. Love keeps no records of wrong. We can't keep the scorecard, but we got to throw the scorebooks away. Love keeps no records of wrong. God has covered the sin. We must try to cover the sin. God does not permit us to vent our frustration. God does not permit us to gossip about these things. Ephesians 4, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building up others according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Down in verse 31, it says, get rid of bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, and slander. In verse 32, it says, be kind and compassionate 
to one another, forgiving each other just as God forgave you. 1 John 4, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not know God, does not love, does not know God, because God is love. Somebody needs to write a song about that, right? We sang it here last, last week or two. God is, is love. His love is made complete in us when he lives in us, when his spirit dwells in us, and when his spirit causes us to go try to fix these relationships with our brothers and sisters. I like the King James Version. It says, be kind to one another. This is Ephesians 4, 32. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted. King James uses the word tender-hearted. I like that word. We need to be tender-hearted toward our brothers and sisters. Sometimes a heart might grow a little callous. Sometimes it might grow a little stone cold. Sometimes it might become to where it can't turn around. We need to be tender-hearted. I look at Eva and Magdalene. You want to know some tender hearts? That, that, that's tender-hearted. Their little hearts, you, you can say just something in the wrong way stop doing that and you know that they, they just melt you know that but that's tender-hearted we have to become tender-hearted i want to read uh, the lyrics of a song it's uh, called come to the table by the sidewalk prophets i don't know how many of you have heard of the sidewalk prophets but they've got some good lyrics in this song it says we all start on the outside the outside looking in that's where grace begins. We were hungry, we were thirsty, with nothing left to give. Oh, the shape that we were in. Just when all seemed lost, love opened the door for us. He said, come to the table. Come join the sinners who have been redeemed. Take your place beside the Savior. Sit down and be set free. Come to the table. Come meet this mighty crew of misfits, these liars and thieves. There's no one unwelcome here. That sin and that shame that you brought with you, you can leave it at the door, and you can let mercy draw you near. So come to the table. Come join the sinners who have been redeemed. Take your place beside the Savior. Sit down, be set free. Come to the table. Come to the table to the thief and the doubter, to the hero and the coward, to the prisoner and the soldier, to the young and to the older, all who hunger and thirst, all the last and all the first, all the paupers and the princes, all who fall, you have been forgiven. All who dream and all who suffer, all who loved and lost another, all the chained and all the free, all who follow, all who lead. Anyone who's been let down, to all the lost you have been found. All who have been labeled right or wrong, to everyone who hears this song, come to the table. Come join the sinners you've been redeemed. Take your place beside the Savior. Sit down and be made free. That's what it's all about, coming to the table. Come have your sins washed away. Come have your sins made right. Come let the blood of Jesus Christ cover your sins. Come to the table. Let your sins bother you as much as my sins bother you. Come to the table. That's what it's all about. I read a book a long time ago and it was like, can't hardly remember the title, but it was something like the, the seven defining moments of my life. And in that book, it mentioned like your marriage, uh, you know, your, your education, your job, your relationship with Christ. And it had these moments that, that turned into weeks and months and days, and it kind of, these things defined your life. I can remember a defining minute. I can remember the minute that it happened. 
And in my mind, I can tell you every detail that was in that room. About 20 years ago, we were at St. Jude. Rebecca was sick. We were still in the, the throes, not knowing which way things were going to go. And uh, we were over there for an appointment. And we walked back to the appointment, and the room was maybe about the size of the fellowship hall. And I mean, that room was packed. There wasn't a, a place to sit anywhere. And I, looking around, Robin and Rebecca found a place to sit. And way back there in the corner, there was a little kitchenette, a little like we have in the nursery back there, a little kitchenette. So I walked over there, and they had one of these little chairs that's in our nursery back there. So I'm sitting down with my knees up beside my, my ears, you know, crunched down, but that was the only chair in this room. And this little girl there, her name was Shakira. We had different skin color, we had different hair color, we had different everything. There was nothing that would draw us to, to each other by the way we looked on our appearance. Shakira had some kind of bad cancer, I, I, I don't know what it was, but her body was swollen two or three times because she'd been taking prednisone and steroids that I did know and do know what that looks like. And her body was so swollen, she, she moved like a robot. She had no fluid, fluid way of moving. She was, she was stiff and rigid and couldn't hardly turn. And she was over there cooking on that little plastic kitchen playset. She spun around to me. She said, you like eggs? I said, yeah, I love eggs. So she made me some imaginary eggs. She brought them over there and she set them down. And I ate the eggs. She went back to cooking. Spun around. You like bacon? Yeah, baby. I love bacon. She made me some imaginary bacon. This is hard on her. This is not you know, this, this is difficult, her movements. And she brought me the bacon. Spun back around. Said, you like grits? Said, yes, I love grits. She made me some grits. And she come back, and we were eating grits and bacon and eggs, and I was fighting back the tears, much like I'm doing now, just having a good time. Rebecca's name got called, so we got up, we went back to her appointment, and we were back there 45 minutes an hour. We were back there for a long time. And I can't even remember the news that we got that day. But anyway, we're, we're, we're coming out of the appointment. Where I went into the appointment it was on the opposite side of the room where the, the plastic kitchen was. The room was still crowded. And as we came out of that the appointment, I heard a voice over every thing in that room, over all the voices in that room. Hey, where's my hug? She was waiting on me to come out where I could go over there and give her a hug. I went over there and I gave the child a hug. Let me tell you something. She didn't care what color my skin was. She didn't care what my job was. She didn't care what my political affiliation was. She didn't care about any of my opinions. She didn't care about anything other than the fact she was loving me with everything she had. Somewhere I read something about, unless you become converted, and become like little children, you're not going to make an end. We need to be loving each other with everything that we've got. We're on the horizon of doing something great here in Athens. I believe that with all my heart. And we need to love each other through it. We need to love each other through the other end and beyond. We need to love the men that had the vision. We need to love the people that give the support. We need to love the plan. We need to do great things for God. What must I do to go to heaven? I need to love the Lord my God with all my heart, my soul, my strength, my mind. And I need to love my neighbor as myself. Do we need to leave the 
comfort zone of the 99 good relationships and go repair the one broken one. I read something about that somewhere too. You know what's going on in your heart. You know what's going on with your fellow brothers and sisters. I would just hate to think infighting or, or disagreements in, within ourselves and among ourselves would prevent us from doing the great things that God has planned for us to do. That would prevent us from reaching a vision. That would prevent us from reaching other people who are out there that need Jesus, that need salvation. You know, it all starts here. It all starts here. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would use me as an instrument of your love. I pray that you would use us as instruments of your love. I pray that you would soften my heart. I pray that you would soften our hearts. I pray that you would soften the places where perhaps they might have grown hard and cold. Father, I pray that you'll push me out of my comfort zone, that you allow me to show love far past my inner circle. I pray this for our congregation here. I pray your blessings on our congregation here as we strive to do your will. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to have an invitation song now. If we can help you in any way, pray for you, love on you, please come while we stand and sing. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my pardon, this I see. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing, this my plea. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. <clears throat> nothing can for sin atone, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Not of good that I have done, Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Please be seated. Song prepare minds for Lord's Supper will be when my love grows, love for Christ grows weak. When my love for Christ grows weak, when for deeper faith I see, then in Lord I There 
behold his agony suffered on the bitter tree see his anguish see his pain love triumphant still in then to life I turn again, learning all the worth of pain, learning all the might that lies in a full sacrifice. Before we take the communion this morning, I'd just like to read a little bit from 1 Corinthians. It's chapter 11 and starting with verse 23. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the day, that he, in the night which he was betrayed, took bread. We had given thanks. He broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me, if you would. Take the bread to remind us of the sacrifice that Jesus made, putting his body and taking the blows that we deserved that he didn't, if you would. Here Paul continues, says, In the same way he took the cup also after supper, saying, The cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this, and as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So if you would take the cup, a reminder of the sacrifice, Jesus shedding his blood, the only thing that could work for the remission of our sins. bear with me just for a moment for a short prayer to God in heaven thank you for this ceremony that you established known us so well that only a constant reminder can help things from just becoming normal something that we don't remember to be grateful for but here we gather in remembrance of your son's sacrifice thank you so much since in name we pray amen offer a special word of thanks to Robbie and to Dexter both. You both did a wonderful job this morning. It's, it's been good to be here. I can truly say that. As far as our family matters are concerned, about the only thing that I have it, uh, to let you know of, if you hadn't already heard, is that tonight would normally be our night to gather together to celebrate birthdays and anniversaries. But because we gathered on Wednesday night, we're going to put that off until February the 20th, where we will then celebrate all the anniversaries from January and February. Is there anything that I'm missing that might need to be mentioned this morning? Let's go to God in prayer and then we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, there are so many things that we could ask you for and that we need. But at this time and at this moment, the only thing we're asking is that you help us to learn to love one another more, to love you with all that we have, and to cultivate every relationship that you give us here on this earth. In Jesus' name, amen.